are recording. Okay. And throw on the captions. What I may do right now is just kind of, if, if you're new to this work group and you're joining us for the first time, um, just to give a little refresher on, on sort of the flow of what we do. So we're gonna have a wonderful presentation by Sonia Brooke today. Um, so we usually start with a presentation and then we have some time for questions. And then we do have an optional half hour um, at the end where we do some networking, some sharing of information. We can ask questions of each other, uh, share resources and that kind of thing. So just a little refresher if you're, if this is your first time joining us. And we may go ahead and start with announcements. I've got a couple of people that are emailing me with trouble with the link, so I'm gonna try and help them. Okay, all right, great. Yeah, so we will go ahead and maybe start with announcements while um, Patrick helps out some of our folks. Um, to start with, I just want to announce that the Sustainable Farms and Fields funding is currently open. Um, if you are working with a landowner or if you are a landowner that is interested in implementing some agroforestry practices, this funding is through the Washington State Conservation Commission. Um, and you can reach out to your local conservation district to help you put in potentially an application for funding. And this is implementation funding. So it's funding available to implement agroforestry practices and it is linked to carbon sequestration. Um, so there's a little calculating and a little bit of an application process, but it's a great pool of funding available now. And I will say that they are gonna do their first poll of applications July 1st. So just to put that on everyone's radar, and I am putting a link to their site um, in the chat here, um, if anyone's interested in that. And then I believe Mark and Patrick also had some announcements for the group. And if you're just joining us, we're we're doing some announcements at the moment. I can share a quick announcement. Um, I recently joined the Association for Temperate Agroforestry uh, Agroforestry's board. I became a board member for the Association for Temperate Agroforestry is another better way to put that. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a very exciting opportunity. Um, and one of the goals of the association as they kind of go through this reorganization that they're doing uh, is to support local work groups like this. So I think it will be a great opportunity to make sure that Pacific Northwest has a voice um, and a seat at the table, literally. Um, so so that's, you know, I've only attended one meeting so far and it's a two year term. Um, but one of the big things, if you're unfamiliar, that the association does is the biennial conference, um, North American Agroforestry Conference. The next one will be in Costa Rica in this winter. Um, but typically it's more in a less tropical location and it's a great opportunity to go and learn about new research. And uh, so the association helps manage that, but they're also looking to kind of expand their reach and do more uh, support to the local groups and things like that. And I stuck their link in the, in the chat too, if anyone wants to check, check them out a little more. And if anyone wants to go to Costa Rica, they should. I don't think I'm going to be able to yeah. make that one, but it will be an excellent conference. Do you know when in winter it is, Patrick? I believe it's February. I don't know if they've February. released the actual dates yet. Okay, February 2024. Great. Mm -hmm. And Mark, did you have any announcements at this time? or? Uh, yeah, just briefly. I'm in the hiring process for uh, getting hired by the National Agroforestry Center. Um, I'll be based in Corvallis, Oregon, so I'll continue to be part of this group, um, but 
the next meeting, I'll be wearing a different hat. What's really exciting is to actually have some rep representation from the National Agroforestry Center in our region. So that is, that's fabulous. Congrats, Mark, Thanks. on that. Um, all right, those are announcements. Um, and we will turn it over to Patrick and Sonia um, for our presentation today. Yeah, I'll give a brief introduction and then I'll, Sonia, I'll, I'll let you kind of take it away from there. Um, so, so sorry, I pulled up your, uh, your Forest Service page here so I don't destroy your title. Uh, Sonia Bruck is a research economist with the Forest Service uh, based at the Southern Research Station out of North Carolina. Formerly, Sonia was a uh, graduate student. I should say Dr. Sonia Bruck because uh, she was successful in grad school at uh, Oregon State University and helped manage the uh, work group that was based out of OSU. Um, so very interested in agroforestry and her and I got to work a little bit um, when she was in that position together. So uh, very excited to hear from her about her research in soil pasture because I don't think I ever got to actually see your dissertation or defense or anything. So this is going to be very good to, to hear uh, about all that research you did. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, okay, well, I didn't know how deep to go into certain topics, so maybe it'll be some review that I can skim through, or maybe it'll be a nice review, I don't know. But um, yeah, I created just like a little about me page. So um, I did get my uh, master's and PhD at Oregon State. Um, I actually did this work for my master's degree, and then for my PhD, I was um, assessing adoption of intercropping systems in Tanzania. So I was in rural Tanzania for about nine months, uh, very close to the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo border. Um, and then uh, COVID happened, and during that period of time, I was an instructor um, at Oregon State um, teaching agroforestry systems, as well as tourism and recreation economics for the trail program. Um, I then moved back to, to North Carolina, which is where I'm from uh, originally, and um, had an ORISE fellowship. So that's with the Oak Ridge National Lab, um, technically out of Tennessee, um, but they, it's a whole program where they place recent graduates with uh, agencies. Um, I then had a postdoc for about like six months at North Carolina State University, and I'm back here with the the Forest Service is a research economist um, in the Forest Policy and Economics Unit. Um, so I primarily in my role study timber markets and trade and forest disturbances, um, but I still am very interested in agroforestry and how agroforestry can enhance markets, how it can play a role in forest disturbances. So um, yeah, so I'm still, I'm still doing agroforestry research. Um, okay, so this is probably a review, but again, a broad definition of agroforestry, it's the collective name for land use systems and technologies where woody perennials are deliberately planted on the same land management unit with agricultural crops and or animals. And that means that agroforestry can be practiced in the same time period or sequentially, right? So it's not just uh, trees. It also includes woody perennials such as bamboos. Um, in the case of my dissertation topic, it included cassava and pigeon pea. Um, which were shrubs, so it's not not just trees. And I always like to say whenever I'm giving an agroforestry talk, anytime I'm giving a talk, that it's not agroforestry isn't new. Um, it's this ancient practice that farmers have been using um, since the beginning of time, since the beginning of cultivation. It's used throughout the world. Um, this was a photo that I actually took in Tonga, Tanzania. Um, which is located on the coast of Tanzania. And you can see here that in the front uh, of the image, there's sort of this uh, you know, grass that they're growing. They used to for a cut and carry system where they would cut the grass and feed it to their livestock. In that mid layer, you see that they're growing bananas. And in that top layer, uh, the overstory, um, this particular landowner had some trees that he was growing. Um, those particular trees had fruits. Um, with which they were edible and they also used it for a timber product. So that was a, a traditional system that um, this particular farmer was using. 
Um, we have someone, I guess, from NAC, or soon to be from NAC, but um, the agroforestry classifications uh, in the United States that are recognized by NAC. And so like, what does that mean that re recognized classification? And to me, that typically means that it's more heavily studied than in the United States and that there's some policy or monetary support that is given um, associated with these systems that are classified as recognized. So recognized by NAC are riparian buffers, forest farming, hedgerows or windbreaks, alley cropping or intercropping, and silvopasture. Um, there's other types of agroforestry systems that are used globally. Um, these include other mixed, used, um, mixed land use systems, such as Tangia systems. So Tangia, originally from Java, Indonesia, is where um, workers would go out amongst the plantations. They would cultivate uh, their crops in between the rows and then as those trees grew larger, they were pushed out of cultivating, right? So it was kind of a shifting agricultural system. And that's one of the earliest uh, times when people actually started to study these agroforestry systems was with Tangia systems. There's also home gardens, which um, I mean, I'm sure that many of you here have a home garden where you cultivate food or on your property. Um, particularly in developing countries, home gardens can have a very traditional structure. So, for example, we know that like Native Americans in the United States, they had this three sister structure where they had corn, beans and squash that were together in a home garden setting. And um, then there's these other very traditional structures where um, peoples would plant certain crops together or in certain locations around their home. Um, there's also apiculture, which is considered part of silviculture, where it's bees and trees often among food crops to enhance pollination. There's community forestry. Um, this is very popular in developing countries, but as I understand, it's becoming more popular in the United States, where local communities can manage forests for timber as well as non-timber forest products. Uh, there's fallows and contour farming. So fallows, meaning that there's that sequential agroforestry system where you cultivate your crops and they're planted for a period of time and then you leave it for fallow where the woody perennials might take over and you shift around and come back to that same system. And contour farming where trees are planted on those slopes to reduce erosion and enhance water infiltration, um, especially on steeper slopes. Um, there's also the talk about permaculture and how it's kind of agroforestry adjacent. Um, however, permaculture typically abides by a code of ethics where they have uh, care for the earth, considering the needs of others and sharing the surplus. Whereas with agroforestry, we're not really talking about any code of ethics that's associated with it. It's more of like a scientific endeavor. And of course there's many other uh, traditional systems. Okay, so silvopasture, that's why everyone joined today is that's what they wanna talk about is silvopasture. So silvopasture is a plant and managed agroecosystem in which forage, livestock, and woody perennials are integrated in order to enhance individual components. Okay, so maybe as a review, there's some benefits and there's some downsides as with every land management system. So livestock, uh, so benefits to livestock uh, can include that the trees slow wind speed, so the animals are more comfortable. Um, the trees provide shade, which is a really big deal. You don't have to provide structures, but you can actually grow trees that provide shade that enhance the calving rate of your animals. Um, the forages that are planted uh, under trees actually can provide different nutrients. So there's different forages that are planted under shade versus an open and those uh, that diversity in food can enhance your livestock. There's also economic benefits. So there's multiple output, outputs from that single system from that one un, uh, single land parcel, um, as well as a risk reduction, right? So if one year um, the price of meat or the price of dairy is very, very low. Well, then maybe you say, well, I have this standing stock of timber. I could dip into that this year if the price of timber is uh, doing pretty well and make up for that loss of uh, income from livestock. 
Um, the livestock also consume those understory weeds. So potentially you can use less herbicide, which is something that you would ultimately have to pay for. Um, and then of course there's the ecosystem services where you can enhance that nutrient cycling. Um, there's fire mitigation, which I know is oftentimes talked about in the Pacific Northwest where you can use uh, livestock to trample down ladder fuels. You can use goats to eat ladder fuels. And I think that is something that is um, if has not already been explored uh, rigorously scientifically is something that really could benefit from uh, some research done. Um, there's also carbon storage, of course, where there's been a couple of studies. Uh, one that comes to mind is like Dubé et al, where you can have basically these closed loop systems where we know that uh, having livestock, you know, from their releases uh, emits greenhouse gases. And so you can ha basically have this closed loop system where people have estimated the number of trees in order to uptake the carbon that is released from your livestock. So uh, potentially mitigating climate change. So that all sounds great. Why doesn't everyone adopt silva pasture? Well, you need more knowledge uh, to manage these land systems. Now you don't just have to know about trees or just about livestock. You have to know about both. You have to know about soils. You have to know about soil compaction and fertilization. And you know you have to know a lot more. Uh, you also have to have uh, markets for all of those products and know those markets pretty well. There's also increased management uh, time and overall labor. Um, it's much harder to manage both systems. Um, it can be expensive to establish, especially if you're going from pasture to silva pasture. Um, quite oftentimes people go from a tree system to silva pasture, which can be a little bit less expensive, especially if you can uh, make revenue off of a thinning. Um, there's difficulties in mechanization. Uh, so if you're trying to go out and seed a pasture and you have trees in that pasture, then you have to know how to navigate that appropriately. Um, and finally, there's potential legal or tax constraints, as well as inadequate policies. Um, is it ag land? Is it forest land? You know, like you have to know what the policies are in your particular area to make it a profitable system so that you're, you're taxed appropriately. Um, so these are some images that I took on the top is a uh, loblolly pine um, in coastal North Carolina, and then a mixed hardwood and loblolly pine system also taken near coastal North Carolina, um, where people were managing forage under, under trees in order to run cattle. Okay, so it's always nice to look at some photos to see what we're talking about. Um, all of these photos were taken from the NAC repository. So on the left is in Florida, taken in 2002 of Southern yellow pine and livestock. On the right is Georgia slash pine, about 20 years with Bahia grass and crimson clover for livestock. Um, you can actually, I think, notice in, in this image, can you see my cursor here? Yeah, you can notice in this image that they have a hot wire running through the pasture. And what I've noticed in particular with silver pasture systems is that rotational grazing is extremely important. So typically you'll rotationally graze uh, through both open and treed pastures. And that ensures that your pastures uh, produce enough forage, but also that your livestock are receiving the proper nutrients. All right, so this is uh, on the left, goats and pine, uh, biograss, big blue stem and blackberry. And on the right is dug fur and sheep taken in Oregon. So a lot of different types of systems that are possible. Okay, so some best practices when it comes to silva pastoral systems, again, that need for rotational grazing between open and treed pastures. Um, you have to accommodate for seedling browsing. So you have to potentially uh, protect your trees uh, until the initial leader is above that browse height. So either with exclusion of animals for a certain period of time or fencing them out. 
Um, trees need to be pruned and then to maintain optimal stocking density and manage for light, right? So if you're planting a warm season grass that needs a lot of light under trees, then that's not going to suit you well, right? You have to know which type of forages to plant where and manage for uh, that competition. Um, there's some tree species that um, can be potentially harmful to livestock. So knowing the right tree for the right place, that's uh, the slogan out of urban forestry, but it's incredibly true for agroforestry as well. Um, I think I've seen in the literature that black cherry, black locust, and red oak are species to not include with livestock. Um, accommodating for forages that prefer shade. So again, those cool season forages, perennial ryegrass, tall fescue, clover, all of those things can uh, tolerate lower light. Um, and then you also have to manage for soil compaction. This was a topic that was, um, you know, super contentious, I guess, uh, where foresters wanted to keep livestock out of the forest because they would say, okay, you're going to ruin your trees because of the soil compaction. And we know that not to be so true now. However, it's still something to, to manage for and that you can be managed, for, uh, managed uh, with rotational grazing. Okay. So there's a couple of different types of tree formations and arrangements that are typically seen with silver pasture systems. So these are um, a few that were provided by Hamilton 2008, where you can have this single row of trees that are spaced eight to 12 feet within row and 16 to 30 feet between rows, as you see in the top right. And then in the top, the bottom left, excuse me, um, is a double row, um, eight to 10 feet between trees and uh, rows in a wider alley that can promote better forage growth between those rows or you know, within the alleys. There's also this triple and quadruple row spacing where trees are spaced very uh, tightly together with a very wide row. However, the center trees can typically be of poor quality. So it's typically not recommended to plant in this formation. And then there's also multiple row spacing in the bottom, two to three rows of trees at close spacing, um, maybe eight to 10 or 20 to 40 feet. Um, what is, what I've seen typically is this type of block planting arrangement where you have open pasture and then you also have blocks of trees that can mimic a natural forest stand. So um, just for example, this little image here, right? You have this open pasture and then you have a block of 12 by 12 or 15 by 15, uh, depending on your equipment and depending on your needs, such that you have a sufficient amount of trees that can uh, pro generate and provide income, but also you have this open pasture that accommodate your, can accommodate livestock needs. Okay, so um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, my master's research was to determine the economic viability of silvopastoral systems for landowners in Eastern North Carolina and Northeastern Oregon. Um, and so why, why silvopasture? So silvopasture in the literature has been identified as the most promising agroforestry regime for both the North, uh, Pacific Northwest and Southeast United States. Um, these are a couple of articles that, that, say, that say that. <laughs> um, okay, so it started in Goldsboro, North Carolina. This is CEFS, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. They have an experimental agroforestry plot out there. I think they've actually expanded to multiple experimental agroforestry plots. And they started out doing intercropping on this particular plot, and then they transitioned to silvopasture. So you can see here um, the experimental area. This was where they planted these different tree systems. So it was um, red oak, love volley pine, longleaf pine, and uh, cherry bark oak planted on this experimental plot. <clears throat> And then uh, 
also decided to take a look at the Blue Mountain region in the LaGrand Baker City region of Oregon. Uh, typically, the tree that you most commonly see there is Ponderosa pine. Um, I actually took this image at a sentry farm where they had thinned out this ponderosa pine and were running cattle. Again, you can see they're using that rotational grazing technique where they have hot wire placed. Okay, so data gathering, uh, collected pertinent literature, discussed uh, silvopasture with extension agents, experts in the field, attended workshops, attended SAFs. Uh, talked with people out there who were managing these systems, and then also those in situ visits. So I visited some landowners that were either interested in silvopasture or were practicing silvopasture to see what their typical management style was. And from that, I was able to identify three typical silvopastoral systems, those being loblolly pine, cool and warm season grasses with livestock, Longleaf pine, cool and warm season grasses with livestock. Those are both in North Carolina. And then again, that ponderosa pine with native forages and livestock. So native forages because typically people in Oregon were not seeding, whereas people in North Carolina do seed. So these were all images that, um, that I took. This image here was actually taken at SEFS, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, and that was the longleaf pine. And you can see it must have been in like the winter time because the, uh, the oak is defoliated. Um, so then we went through some scenario planning. Um, we collected relevant budgets and cash flow um, in order to conduct the cash flow analyses. So those budgets were compiled by uh, these individuals, Hussick and Grado, Cabbage, Glenn and Mueller, Cabbage and Apt, Lurie and Bailey. These were where we got all of the prices from. And the same uh, relevant types of budgets for Oregon. So from ODF, um, different revenues and yields from Bowers, Painter and Rimby had a livestock budget and Fitzgerald and Emmingham 2005 had a forage description budget. So um, yeah, that's where we were able to collect all the prices from. And again, it's old, right? Cause this was uh, my master's work which was quite, quite a couple of years ago. So the prices I think were all in either 2013 or 2014 prices. Okay, so we created these activity schedules. Um, this is for Loblolly Pine Silva Pasture Activity Schedule. So this was per 100 acres. And you can see basically that um, I established the, the year in the far left corner. So which, which year the activity occurred in the activity itself, the estimated cost per 100 acres, and then the unit here. So right in year zero, we have sort of that establishment and site prep. We have uh, five through 25 where we have replacement purchases. So the um, cow and bull replacement purchases, animal maintenance and ownership. So that included stuff like vaccines for the animals. Um, we had loblolly pine management, so a typical yearly management price. Um, and then, of course, there was sales, right? So that's where you get your revenue from. Um, and then thinning and harvest, right? So those are all revenue streams. And the same was done here for the longleaf pine. This was also per 100 acres. And then this was ponderosa pine silva pasture, and this was cost per 1,000 acres. And this was just to simply uh, scaling for the activity schedules. Everything was down to a per acre and per hectare basis for analysis. But typically, uh, landowners in Eastern Oregon, as many of you know, I'm sure similar to I'm sure similar to Eastern Washington, have a lot more acreage than people do in North Carolina in general. Okay, so quickly, uh, what is a cash flow analysis? Um, in simplest, simplest terms, it's the inflows and outflows of money. Um, typically, you incorporate what's called a discount rate, which is the time value of money. So if you have a very high discount rate, then you want those benefits sooner. You're not willing to wait a long time to receive benefits. And if you have a low discount rate, you're saying, I can wait a little bit longer for benefits to accrue. So typically public land managers have a very low discount rate and compared to a private land manager, 
Um, for public land management, this uh, 1981 article, maybe some of you know who John Sessions is, um, determined that the public discount rate for Forest Service land is about 4%. Uh, typically, if you're a private land manager, you might have a little bit of a higher discount rate, but it's kind of a preference for the individual, right? So if you're managing your land and you're expecting revenue or, you know, it's your livelihood, then maybe you have a slightly higher discount rate than those managing public lands who can wait a very long time for those benefits to occur. Okay, so for these cash flow analyses, we conducted them with a four and 6% real discount rate. Okay, so um, in simplest terms, again, the analyses were conducted on a per acre per hectare basis, and they were reported in a per hectare basis using 2014 prices. Um, Typically, if you're comparing, uh, right, so when we look at these economic indicators, what we're doing is we're comparing projects or we're comparing uh, to which land management system do we use, right? And we're a rational person. We want to have the system that gives us the most money, right? So um, if we're doing a single rotation and comparing projects that have the same uh, time length, then we can look at NPV. However, if we're, which is net present value. However, if we're comparing systems that are on different rotation lengths, then we typically look at land expectation value. And really all you need to know is that the higher the revenue, the better the system is, right? The higher the revenue, that's the system that you're gonna wanna choose in general. So, okay, what did we find? So um, these standard, right? So you see log lolly pine standard, long leaf pine standard, livestock standard, right? That's just those systems by themselves, managed by themselves. So log lolly pine standard is just managing the land for log lolly pine, long leaf pine standard, just managing for long leaf, livestock standard, just managing for livestock. Um, the warm season and cool season grasses, right? So we were looking to see, okay, establishment cost of these different grasses is different. So looking at our land expectation value, if we were just looking down the list and we were saying, okay, what's going to produce us the highest uh, revenue? Well, that's going to be in 2014 prices or so the 4% real discount rate. It's the livestock standard. That's the one that we're going to choose. It was a really, really good year for livestock prices with uh, about $5,000 per hectare. Okay, but let's say, you know, we really wanna manage a silver pastoral system, which one is gonna provide us the highest revenue? And we can look down the list and see that at about 2,500 per hectare, the loblolly pine and cool season grasses is gonna provide us the, the highest revenue. Okay, so with a 6% real discount rate, remember we're not willing to wait for those benefits to accrue, we want them sooner. Um, again, it should come out with the same result, except our revenue should be lower, right? So about 2,900 for livestock standard. And again, the law volley and cool season silver pasture is what we would choose at about $935 a hectare. Okay, what about Oregon? Oregon, our ponderous pine, sorry, these are so blurry. Ponderosa pine was negative, so it sounds like we're not going to establish ponderosa pine because we would be in, in the red. Standard livestock was about 2,000 per hectare, and the silver pasture was about 691 per hectare. And this is a 4% real discount rate. So whenever I was like teaching a class, I would always kind of throw it back at them and say, why would you choose to do silvopasture when you could make so much more uh, just managing livestock? Why? I couldn't tell if that was rhetorical or not. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like I, I've just been talking at you. Why, why do you I, think I would Patrick? say, um, well, 
this is maybe in a scenario where you're expanding grazing space into an existing forest that's more adding value to an existing ponderosa pine system so as opposed to like planting ponderosa pine into a, a existing grazing space i could see where that would pencil out mm -hmm. yeah for sure um but then there's additional benefits from civil pasture obviously um i don't know if those are factored into this but like uh, like you said, like temperature control or temperature moderation for livestock, healthier livestock. I mean, there's a lot of studies that's shown there's a lot of benefits to livestock and, you know, reaching target weights quicker and things like that. But um, I don't know if that would really offset the numbers that we're seeing here. So yeah. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> no, you're exactly yeah. right. It's those ecosystem services and benefits that we talked about at the very beginning that weren't factored into this analysis, where it was purely just the inflows and outflows of monetary value, right? What's the cow worth? But we didn't necessarily factor in, okay, well, like, what's the marginal gain in meat productivity when you factor in having trees? Maybe you're uh, getting more uh, meat per animal, more, you know, uh, AUMs, is that what it's called per animal? Or uh, maybe you're sequestering more carbon and that's really important to you to offset your emissions, right? So all of those things can factor into a landowner decision to potentially make less revenue or slightly less revenue than they would um, not having adopted a system such as silvopasture. And it presents opportunities for payments for those ecosystem services down the line. I just add that too. For sure, yeah. Um, and then again, here's the the six percent real discount rate. So maybe in this case, if you're if you're in the red, if you're negative, you wouldn't choose to do the silver pasture system. Okay, so the bottom line here is that these management regimes were a few robust probable silver pasture regimes out of the infinite number of possibilities, right? So these were typical management regimes, what's called scenario planning, but for an individual landowner, these numbers uh, most definitely would be different. Um, and these were, were all of the people who helped during this project. And here's the article in Journal of Forestry, if you're interested in reading it, um, as well as my email for contact info. So, yeah, thanks for, for having me. I'm sorry I ran over a few minutes. Oh, no, you're, you're totally fine. We've got plenty of time. Um, actually, is there anyone you could copy and paste that link into the chat? I would love to be able to read the, the full paper. Yes. Or even email it afterwards and I can send it to folks. Sure, I can do that. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Sonia. I really appreciate that. That was awesome. Um, and Hollis, you probably missed it, but uh, in the chat also mentioned to your question, uh, diversified investments options for mixed use like forest recreation. So yeah, there's a number of things you can do once you have trees on the landscape, um, but it's really interesting to see it in raw numbers like that, for sure. And I I see a lot of opportunity, as I said, for civil pasture as expanding grazing space into forest. But we do mm -hmm. get a lot of people that are interested in planting trees into grazing space. And it's exactly those people that value those things that you mentioned, um, like ecosystem services and, uh, you know, potentially planting more high, you know, trees that produce more high value crops than just timber, or something yeah. like that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so at this point, though, we can open it up to any questions from the group. We've got kind of a smaller group today, but um, sometimes that makes for better conversation. So if there are any questions, feel free to unmute uh, or type them in the chat and I can read them. I came up with a few questions of my own during, but I don't want to hog Sonia's time. So I'll let you guys sit for a second. And if you don't have anything, I'll ask some of my questions. It's always awkward, but I'm I'm told you're supposed to wait eight seconds. Eight seconds of silence. <laughs> I see something in the chat there, Patrick. Oh, I missed it. Sorry, Sarah. No problem. Um, yeah, so Sarah asked, 
given a non-exceptional cattle price year, how do these numbers change? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, so I think what would happen is that the silva pasture land expectation value would overall go down and that, um, you know, it, yeah, I think that your silver pasture expectation would go down because typically tree price volatility is relatively stable. Um, you don't see quite large fluctuations in roundwood prices uh, as you do with livestock prices. So I think that you would overall see a reduction in, in profitability of silver pasture, but that's just a guess. Would it be kind of a one-to-one -one reduction with the livestock standard or would the livestock standard maybe get hit a little harder than silver pasture? Um, that's a great question. So I, I think that um, the silver pasture potentially would be like hit less hard because you're mm -hmm. incorporating other revenue streams, right? So your trees. So you overall reduce your, your risk of catastrophic failure as a land manager if you can fall back upon your trees for harvest. Can, can I ask a follow-up question too? Sure. These were uh, forested systems that you were introducing silver pasture into by removing trees. Is that accurate? Um, it was the reverse actually. So it was um, it was establishing entire silver pasture systems from bare land. So going from just a bare land, no grass, no trees system. So that's why you see uh, the Oregon numbers being so low is that typically people in, in Oregon, and I would maybe assume uh, Washington are typically not planting ponderosa pine. It's a natural regen situation. And there's not, at least when I was there, there was not many uh, mills uh, either in the vicinity or that were taking ponderosa. And so that's why the, the price of trees was so low. So a forestry standard starting from pasture would obviously be higher, would be more expensive than a forestry standard starting from forest. Um, similarly, if you were starting from a forest and you're trying to go to a cattle standard, there would be an enormous expense there. Um, so the, the standard, like which standard wins out or even potentially where silver pasture fits in, it's really dependent on your starting situation. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yes, that's very true. It depends on um, the starting point that you're working from. Yeah. So I um, anecdotally, one of the landowners that I visited um, in eastern North Carolina had inherited CRP land, so conservation reserve program land. And um, it was planted with traditionally stocked uh, loblolly pine. And he had been managing cattle and thought to himself, oh, like, what if I ran cattle under trees? I'd probably need to thin. And so I kind of got him to do like a back of the envelope calculation where he, uh, you know, told me his revenue from thinning and how much he paid to establish some forages. And he definitely came out in the positive on that system going from a traditionally stocked forest system to, to a silver pasture system. All right, got a couple more questions. Uh, Kevin asked, are the livestock standard and silver pasture systems in the study using continuous grazing or more intensive management like the rotational grazing you mentioned? Um, yeah, so that was not factored into this particular analysis. Um, this was just a uh, average uh, over the year, right? So, um, that was not factored into this analysis. Okay, um, and Marty asked, and I know you probably don't have any well, like numbers on this necessarily, but based on your visits and stuff, did you see any damage on tree roots or bark from grazing in either, you know, the Southeast systems or, or Northeast Oregon? Um, so the places that I went, the landowners were, typically pretty intensively managing. Um, so I did not see any tree damage. 
Um, I think that probably it's like a learning curve to know when to introduce cattle such that they do not damage your trees. Um, but anecdotally, in my experience, I, I did not see that. All right, we got a, um, a sort of similar question from Noah. And I'll add to, I missed Noah's earlier comment, but he mentioned one of the reasons, and this is, I think, a reason a lot of people are interested in silver pasture in Western Washington is as a uh, sort of a, a addressing a resource concern, particularly around riparian buffers and like the outer widths of a riparian buffer, mm -hmm. sort of meeting the needs of the landowner, the, the grazing needs as well as the resource needs, which I thought was really important. Um, so he says, you mentioned that compaction is not as much of a concern as what foresters may perceive. Can you provide some source uh, of information that I can read up for this? Oh, uh, there are sources. I don't remember them off the top of my head. I can um, think of one. If okay. it's helpful. I, well, it was a Charo paper, and I, I guess I could say that's that's all I can remember. I know it was like Charo 2007. And Noah, if, if I don't send that to you, bug me about it. I know you have my email. Um, but I've got one on a, that talks about compaction in, in Doug Fur systems. Um, and hopefully I still have a copy of that somewhere. But if you know of any others, um, even outside of the region, I think it would be beneficial. Or Mark, I know you're obviously really well studied in this region. All right, well, Marty wanted to follow up. She said, um, so are they avoiding damage to the trees by selecting seasons of use or maybe just avoiding just the, through rotational grazing? Um, yeah, so I guess I'll say anecdotally, what I've seen is that typically when the trees are very young, they use uh, exclusion, right? So they'll either protect individual trees or they'll just completely exclude animals from that pasture until the initial leader is above browsing height. Um, and then after that, I guess you could also use exclusion or just intensively rotationally graze to uh, inhibit the animals from thinking that the trees are tastier than the forage, which may or may not exist if you're not rotationally grazing. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if there's other questions, feel free to throw them in. I wanted to ask, and and again, this is just gonna be kind of anecdotally um, your perception of things, but what is the, was there a big difference in the cultural perception of silvopasture between the two regions? like how farmers felt about livestock interacting with trees? Um, I guess I would, I would say that I had a very biased sample because I was selecting, <laughs> I was selecting out people who were already practicing silvopasture or were already interested in practicing silvopasture. So from the people that I met, they, they liked it. Um, however, I'm sure that there's many people who, who do not and for a multitude of reasons. Yeah, and I think in in Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington, there's probably just generally more openness to it just because a long history of grazing on you know public lands where there's forests. Um, I feel in Western Washington, there's a little more uh, hesitance, I guess, because I think they've seen a lot of it go poorly. And I think mm -hmm. it's that rotational grazing component that's really important and exclusion from wet soils and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of times it's just turning cattle into the woods and I've seen that go poorly as well. Um, but I, I was, yeah, I was just curious if there was any big differences you saw there because I know in the Southeast, there's just so much private forest land mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the management is more intense, I think. In some scenario. For sure. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so Kevin asked about black locusts. Uh, he said Steve Gabriel's civil pasture book includes the use of black locusts as a tree forage species um, mm -hmm. for sheep uh, as a part of diverse forage mix for its high protein content. He was curious if you have any thoughts or experience on using black locust. I do not. Um, mm -hmm. I know that 
trad- like in traditional um, systems like in Africa, uh, places that I visited in Africa, these types of cut and carry systems from forage or from trees, uh, coppicing trees is very common. Um, I would assume that black locusts would be a great source of nitrogen, but mm-hmm. I really don't know much more. I think for us here too, red alder is a really good opportunity for that. Um, Mark, I don't know if you have any thoughts on red, uh, not red alder, but black locust. Um, uh, I don't. I, I talked to a few landowners on the west side that have integrated uh, black locust and um, I think it's just matching the the bioregion to the tree or the tree to the bioregion. Um, so, you know, if you have a tree that's used to, you know, 60 centimeters of rain and then you move it to a, a region that has 20 centimeters, um, you get slower growth um, and not so much viability. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Kevin, I guess, was asking about it in terms of avoiding livestock poisoning. I didn't, I don't know. I didn't know if locust was... Uh, I don't know enough, but I thought that it was used for civil pasture. I didn't think it was poisonous to livestock. It might be. Hmm. Um, well, we could do. Is some, it one some of the trees that I listed? Is that why he's asking? It it might be. Yeah, I don't. I, think, I didn't clock it. But. I think those um, species that I listed um, particularly caused miscarriages in mother and mothers. So maybe if you have a calving herd, do not include those. But I can um, look back into it. Okay. One quick question back to your, because you were talking about the different spacing designs and you mentioned like the, the block spacing, which I often call just clump, it's clump silvopasture. And I feel like I, I hear a lot of people, especially like conservation districts kind of interested in that. Um, and I was curious, are they were they excluding livestock entirely from the blocks where there was trees and just having them graze in between and sort of still getting like the shade temperature modification effects from the orientation of the clumps, or are they allowing livestock, you know, into the actual forested parts? Yeah, I think it just depended on the landowner preference and whether they were able to grow enough forage underneath the the trees or if they were just using it as kind of a, a shelter area yeah, yeah. it's okay. like very uh i feel like there's never like a silver silver bullet answer like it's it's dependent upon the landowner management and preferences is typically what i've seen hmm. and sierra thanks sierra he, he posted in some information from Steve Gabriel about locust. Oh, okay. Saying, yeah, there is some anecdotal evidence that it could lead to toxicity, but most farmers found their animals naturally limit their intake. So they kind of okay. know what they're doing. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. Well, are there any other questions for Sonia before we let her go? And you're welcome to stay on, Sonia, but usually what we do at this point is kind of transition to uh sort of regional update kind of conversation and see if anybody's doing anything new or interesting um so you're you're welcome to stick around for that but i know you're busy and we don't want to take up all your time um well yeah i really appreciate you inviting me to to talk today um it's always fun to revisit this research that i did and um yeah i hope to to speak with you guys again or have communication again soon yeah, I got to say, I, I didn't, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize that your PhD stuff was the Tanzania work. Um, mm-hmm. So it would be kind of cool to have you back to hear about that sometime. Um, sure. That sounds really fascinating. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. But yeah, thank you, Sonia. I really appreciate it. And um, her, you know, your email's up there. So if anyone has additional questions, uh, I'm sure they can reach out to you individually. Sounds great. I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah. Trying to figure out how to to close this thing now. (laughs) I can (laughs) kick you off if that makes it easy. (laughs) Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Great. Terry, do you want to kick off the next part?
yeah so i you know we're about at our hour time limit um so if you've got to hop off and get on with other things that's great but we do have some time um, built in to stick around and um, share announcements resources ask questions um whatever a little bit of networking time here if if you guys have anything um and if not again we'll give a little bit of time for folks to chime in and feel free to just chime in um or type something in the chat and if not we um have some things we can bring up as well anybody have any interesting projects they're working on or i'll chime in for a sec just because just as an introduction it's my first time joining on one of these meetings so i'm pretty excited about it but uh my name is kevin i live on in whidbey island on the south end uh, we just have a small homestead about six acres uh pretty sandy and rocky slope and we're establishing a silver pasture system on it um with Kind of alley cropping uh, and Mark kind of Mark Shepard has been my main influence. Um, so we're using uh, chestnuts, hazelnuts, um, apples. Um, and then we'll be adding some currants and elderberries uh, later on, uh, and then with grazing lanes in between. So right now we raise sheep and pigs and uh, broiler chickens. Uh, I used to do turkeys and may do some of those again. Um, so yeah, just that's what we're working on here, and happy to be. Uh, involved in the group so thanks for having me that's awesome yeah that's exactly the kind of stuff we want to hear about it's new projects on the ground um so yeah i'm sorry you said you're planting mostly chestnuts or it's a good mix of chestnuts and apples are kind of the bulk of it uh we're doing mostly uh standard rootstocks for the apples so we're in the big orchard trees um mainly as a, a fall late summer and fall livestock feed um also just for like home cider production uh and then we're also been throwing some mulberries in the mix as well and just trying to see what does well um i've seen a few questions i'm on south Whidbey, kind of near langley and uh the name of the farm currently is dunham farm but we're working on a it's a working title <laughs> we're pretty small scale um and we just sell all our meat directly to people and um it's not too hard to find customers here which is pretty nice um but yeah and i've also been trying to experiment with some forage trees too um i was kind of inspired by steve gabriel's work and so we've been planting uh some willows uh wherever it's slightly wet which we don't have a whole lot of those spots uh and then poplar and uh some locusts as well uh, to do coppicing for kind of the summer so a little bit of summer forage Awesome. Those are some of your systems. What's that? How old are some of your systems? Like, how long have you been doing this? How, how uh, we've been on the property for six years, uh, and the trees have been in for well, the older ones for four, and then okay, um, I'm planting new ones every year. I'm mean, just planting like yeah, between 70 and 80 trees and shrubs, I think, in the last for each year for the last four years, um, just fitting them in all over the place. Nice. And you said you were doing grazing lanes. So are you doing yeah, so uh, kind of like, like just like double rows and stuff? Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, going up our slope, we have the trees kind of going horizontally. Um, I didn't necessarily okay. do contour. Um, I kind of learned about that later. So as we get up higher, I'm starting to experiment with doing more contour plantings. Um, and I mean, I haven't done, built any big swales or anything like that, but I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the best thing for our sandy soil. I'm trying to do more research on it. Um, but yeah, and they're about so far the trees rows are about 50 feet apart. Um, so then we have space in between for the grass to grow and um, it dries out pretty quickly. And the spring has been a little rough because we got so little rain in May. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of grass going at the moment. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks for for sharing. I'd love to stay posted on that. It seems like there's a lot of people on Whidbey Island interested in agroforestry. Yeah. 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 Jake Stewart uh, from Sweetwater Farms introduced me to this group. That's I was just going to ask how you heard about the group. Yeah. Nice. 
Cool. Well, thanks for joining. I hope you you stay connected. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, this is maybe kind of an. Yeah, 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 I uh, we use um, electric netting for the sheep, so I just put it on the inside of the trees, uh, and I do have you know deer protection for now, but sometimes they don't care anyway and <laughs> find a way to take some bites. Um, yeah. And are you rotating? Doing rotational? Yeah. Yeah, pretty intensive. Um, and we, we utilize a few other properties nearby. So um, I, I have a small flock of sheep. I just merged them with another friend of mine. So in total, we have about 18 ewes and 30s, 30 something lambs. And we move them uh, every, we've moved them every day for a couple of months and now we're at every other day. Um, wow. So small paddocks and a lot of movement. Is that in response to the dryness of the spring? Is it just trying to manage? Uh, yeah, and just trying to just get the impact, you know, and get the mm. get the manure spread and more evenly, and you know, all those benefits you read about about moving quickly and, <laughs> and getting yeah. the, the stock density up a little bit. Um, so cool. just playing around with that, but um, we got a good low a uh, low land area that stays pretty green, which we're in now. Um, so that's pretty helpful for the summer. Nice. Yeah. Sort of sharing that that your system that's really really interesting. Yeah, for um, sure. If anyone wants to come out and see it, um, come around. Yeah, I might I might stop by. I go out to South Woodby every now and then. Um, so yeah. I'd love to connect and and come see what you got going on. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah, and if you're open to hosting workshops and stuff. <laughs> I know we just met and it's a little gauche, but <laughs> sorry, I need I need to know more, but I could also yeah. just do a farm tour. <laughs> sure, yeah, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Anyone else working on any interesting systems lately or or thinking about some or We've got a um, a forty acre site down here in outside of Tenino, Washington, South Thurston County, um, and it's a county owned site. And we are thinking, looking at um, putting some silvo pasture on there. It's uh, prairie. It's been grazed, um, pretty misused. This little forty acre, it seems like, um, but it still has a, a fair amount of native prairie plants on it. Um, <clears throat> and there's pocket gopher, endangered endangered pocket gopher on the site. Um, and so I think it's a really exciting, there's, there's certainly um, some pushback from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about incorporating trees into occupied gopher habitat. Um, and so I think it's a really excellent opportunity to get some real data on density of planting and um, go for use of silver pasture and, you know, potentially go for damage to silver pasture. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm excited about that opportunity to, to get some real data. Nice. What's like the objective of the county for that land? I mean, um, is it just conservation or are they trying to turn some sort of agricultural profit off of it? Um, the whole site is 95 acres and it's adjacent to 1300 acres that was just acquired by State Fish and Wildlife. Um, so the county has uh, two parcels, one's 55 acres and one's 40 acres. The 55 acre parcel is uh, pocket gopher mitigation land. Um, so they're going to be um, increasing habitat, increasing native plant communities and using it as credits to offset development permits. Mm. Um, and then the 40 acre site is um, going to be for education, interpretation, demonstration, uh, kind of a mixed use, um, certainly looking at getting animals on site. Um, and so there'll be some private agricultural production there as well. And it's, it's really an, an opportunity for us to demonstrate to the public uh, some of these different techniques and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and 
not just in the realm of silvopasture and agroforestry, but also in the realm of seeding natives into pasture, which has been um, research that we've been doing down here. I say we, but really others have been doing down here for the past 10, 15 years. Right, I remember you mentioned, and you're considering camas. Is that right? Camas is so dense on this site that there's no point in oh, it's already there. kind of <laughs> additions, but certainly a um, uh, indigenous harvest or several indigenous harvests on the site is a is a goal. It's exciting. Yeah. And so you mentioned then that it would be leased to a private farmer to run livestock. Is that how it would work? So we're still creating, because it's county owned property, we have to have a management plan that's filed away. Um, and there'll be a number of different potential uses that are kind of explored in that management plan. I don't know exactly how we're going to interface with private growers. Um, certainly, WSU or the county are, are not going to be livestock owners. Right. Um, and so it would be private, private growers or producers that would bring their animals on site. And whether we're managing those animals while they're on site or whether they're managing those animals to the specification that we jointly develop. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work. But is that kind of what your question was about, or was it more on the leasing part of it and the dollar amount? Or? No, that, yeah, just how that management would intersect and, and yeah, who would, who would own and manage livestock and yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's interesting. I, yeah, I, I see some potential county owned, county owned land like that can have potential for some of these practices, which I think is really interesting. So I'm glad you bring that up. Um, yeah, it's, it's a whole area of land out there that we, we don't typically think of or, um, yeah, very cool. Yeah, Sarah, I think I mentioned last time we talked, but the city of Centralia just bought, um, I, I want to say it's about 80 acres along the Chehalis that they're similarly, it, well, I, I shouldn't say similar because I, I should say they really don't know what they want to do with it. <laughs> and that's in the Department of Ecology has been involved and then I got kind of tagged in that way. But it seems like they're open to some similar native restoration slash mixed use agroforestry stuff. So it'd be really cool maybe to, um, you know, parallel some work on those sites. Yeah, um, let's explore that connection. If you, you know, have an in with the folks that are down there making the decisions, that would be great. Yeah, well, with all those things, it takes a lot of time. It always moves slow, but. Cool, does anybody else have any other interesting projects to share? Um, I have think I've shared all mine in the last few meetings, <laughs> so I'm not doing any repeating. I have a, something to share in case anyone has some feedback. I work for Jefferson County in Port Townsend and I'm involved with uh, habitat restoration for salmon recovery in uh, our South County. So in the vicinity of Brennan and out on the coast on the Hoe. And a, a lot of our property owners are experiencing um, erosion. So one idea we were hoping might be helpful is to, to plant ideally natives like big leaf maple or, um, or conifers would be even better. And to come up with, uh, I guess, value added, I don't, we need to have it um, com comport with the taxing um, requirements so that the property owners don't lose agricultural designations. And, um, and so I just wondered if, if other jurisdictions are, are looking for that because Right now, our pastures just don't stand a chance, and it's very difficult to, you know, um, find funding. Impossible, really, for bank just strictly bank stabilization. And even in some of these larger rivers, it's just so expensive to do that stabilization properly. So, um, anyway, we're just getting started. 
Okay. So, so you're the the issue is um, wanting to plant sort of native perennials and tree, you know, for for bank stabilization, but but risking losing agricultural status in the process. Yeah, we're trying to retain the agricultural status and. Um, a lot of folks are sort of transitioning out of cattle and they're just raising hay. Mm. And so they're not getting a lot of value. And so uh, we're trying to get the you know, um, basic understanding of what advice we might offer or resources folks could be directed towards. And at yeah. least if they also had a, you know, a standing forest of some kind or mixed use, uh, maybe they could bring the livestock back. I mean, they just don't, People are aging out and they don't want to invest in fencing. And so right. it's just kind of nothing is really what's happening, unfortunately. Well, Erica, uh, thanks, Erica. She mentioned um, that she's developed a really awesome hedgerow toolkit that's going to oh, be going okay. live soon. Yeah. And it, 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 it I believe, includes uh, options for species that produce, you know, valuable products. Um, so that could be a really great option. Um, and then Kevin mentioned that those can be funded through NRCS equip grants. Although if you're the county, you may not be eligible for that kind of cost share funding, but um, still, I mean, that, are that's- yeah. Private folks for the most part. Oh, that's right, they're private folks, not county. So, okay, yeah, that's great. And that sustainable farms and fields funding that I mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. I, I don't know if you were on then, Tammy, um, but that's another great option for funding things like that, um, especially if you want harvestable products within some of those systems. Um, Could I be get in touch with you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I will put my contact information here. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I will also. Because the, the simple crep style buffers, they're, they're just going down the river on, um, in both locations. We have little blue tubes Oh, in the no. log jams down the street. <laughs> no. Fortunately, the county didn't plant those, but still, you may hate to see it happen. Yeah. Tammy, I'm curious um, if you could speak to any more specifics about uh, what requirements there are to keep it in ag that they're bumping up against. Like, what well, I just, uh, they don't want to, I mean, I'm speaking for them, but I, any increase in their property taxes, would they wouldn't want to see that. Right. I was just wondering what, um, like, what in the definition of ag land is it because it's prime, it will, would be primarily growing other non agricultural products, or because there's not a mixed use um, designation under ag land, that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, that's why we're looking at big leaf maples because they're both native and produce a product. And maybe that's the only native, maybe cottonwood because they can also be used to make salves. And I don't know how much of a stretch or we can argue for, um, but there won't be any ag land in some of these spots, uh, probably regardless, but we just wanna help where we can. It, you know, we're seeing just so much sediment come down the systems and the beds are grading and the rivers are becoming more increasingly dynamic. And so hmm. it's, a uh, tough road to hoe. If you needed someone to speak to the sort of financial viability of, of maple syrup, I, I would be able to, you know, I'd be happy to help with that. Also, another option would be uh, log grown shiitake. Uh, oh, yeah. Works well in, in alder forest. And that's and also, alder oysters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's it, a so great idea. Are, yeah. Um, so I'd be happy to provide information on that. Okay. As well. Uh, um, and I can put my yeah. my email in there. Okay. If, if you receive the link, you probably receive my email, but I'll, I'll okay. go ahead and put it in the chat anyway. And it's it looks like, it. yeah, Erica added that a link as well. Yeah. And there are so many natives that have 
have use, you just, mm -hmm. you know, just human use and, are, and, and have some kind of productive quality to them. Um, there's a great old publication on that, um, that, that needs to be updated, which I think would be a project that might be great for agroforestry Northwest. Um, but yeah, um, so much opportunity there with just with, with working with natives. Oh, great. That, I mean, I'd love yeah. to not go past that. Yeah. Um, if I if you can get away with it. And Eric, I, know, I know the locusts, honey locusts, they're rhizomatous and I can I just sort of yes. dread the idea of <laughs> that. Yeah. Be there, there's certain other... spots you not want to put those. Yeah. yeah. Erica, you look like you want to say something. Hi, yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I just list, listed the landing page where the new WSU page will go. It's basically done. We're just waiting for WSU to convert it over. Um, the state, the landing page is really awful right now. So I want you to to uh, just check back by the end of the week. Everything should be live and, and looking good, but it will have quite a few tools. And then we are hoping to work more with Patrick and Carrie um, on some more, we have, we have, right now we have native understory things that people can put in to a hedgerow once they're more established and they have some shade, but we're really excited about some of the value added products that Patrick and Carrie have shared with us that could also go into value added hedgerow or to, into a hedgerow to, that would achieve both water quality benefits and potential value added benefits. So, you know, it's, it's a work in progress and um, we're also going to be partnering with Pierce Conservation District this year on some some projects just to kind of continue expanding out the options. So I think of hedgerows as maybe being an, an extension or a, a, an under the umbrella of agroforestry. But the goal here would be, again be to remove very narrow uh, buffers from agricultural production. So there's not a lot of impact to um, productive land while at the same time achieving a whole lot of benefits, whether it's, you know, providing shade for cows or um, supporting natural pest enemies and pollinators and so forth. So anyway, just stay tuned and, and t take a look at that little, keep that link in your browser for a couple of days and, and there should be something exciting there by the end of the week. That's so great. I'll add to that, uh, Carrie and, and Mark and I are patiently awaiting the results of a, a grant proposal to explore this exact idea of, you know, installing trials of, of various native species that could be forest farmed um, and, and kind of looking at their viability from that standpoint. So obviously depends on getting the funding and then it would be years down the line, but um, you know, everything has to start somewhere. So. Well, if there's anyone else has anything to share, we've had a pretty good conversation so far, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to hang out. Um, Carrie, did you have anything else that you wanted to discuss? I think, no, I think now, yeah, I, okay. I'm good at the moment. Um, yeah, thanks for these, um, these conversations and introductions of some of the things you guys are working on. This is great. And it informs all of us. And oh, Noah does have something. Let's see, I'm unmuted. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Ah. So um, yeah, I just wanted to introduce myself because I'm new to the group as well. Um, just interested in learning more about agroforestry. And um, I work with the NRCS, and so obviously trying to think of, of ways that we can assist clients um, who may want to implement these practices. But um, just wanted to make a plug for our programs, um, because we do have practices that um, are programs, environmental quality incentives program and conservation stewardship program can actually help um, folks who might want to implement some of the practices that you're talking about with agroforestry. We don't have an agroforestry practice, but we do have alley cropping, um, forest farming, and silvopasture practice. And we also have, say, like a silvopasture enhancement that could be applied through conservation stewardship program. 
Um, we have a hedgerow practice as well. So if you know you're talking to clients who are interested in, in in implementing some of these practices and you know scratching their head about you know how much it's going to cost, where they might get funding from, NRCS could potentially be a good option. And um, just this year, under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, NRCS. Mm -hmm is receiving a lot of funding and for a separate fund pool um, for IRAs, what we're calling them, IRA specific practices and um, alley cropping, forest farming, silvopasture, hedgerows, you know, wildlife plantings, that's included in these this specific practice list. Um, so what that does is gives another opportunity for a funding source outside of just our general EQIP or what we call classic EQIP program funding. Um, and so a person could apply for a general EQIP and compete in that fund pool. And they could also apply for say an IRA um, financial assistance program and compete within that fund pool if, if they have those specific practices um, involved. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, just really interested in to, to learn how uh, agroforestry can can benefit the resource base out here and and maybe potentially improve you know the bottom lines for our clients and just trying to kind of wrap my head around it because um, what I do in the agency is provide support for our field staff in the west area um, with training and just keeping them up to speed on you know new new things and and new practices innovative ways of thinking so um, really glad to be part of the group and that it's that it's available <laughs> that's great Noah is that um wait last I remembered you were in like Grace Harbor or Jefferson County is that a new position for you to yeah become... so I used to be in uh Montesano I was the resource yeah. conservationist lead planner for uh, Grace Harbor and um yeah I've been now the area conservationist on the west side for close just about a year it'll be a year in July well, that's great. I hope you'll stay connected with the group because we would love to to develop that partnership and kind of support all of that. Um, you know, supporting NRCS agents is a really important part of increasing adoption for all the reasons that you said. I mean, I've heard about that IRI funding and it's really exciting. Well, I think, yeah. Oh, sorry. Did I, I talk over someone? I just had a quick question for Noah. Um, in you said that the forest farming, silver pasture, um, alley cropping funding, is that through EQIP? Is that EQIP funding? Yeah, so EQIP would be, um, sorry, it looks like I got my video working here. Um, yeah, the Environmental Incentives, mm -hmm. Quality Incentives Program. What um, what do some of those projects look like? What exactly is being funded? Like establishment of the system or what? What all yeah, like say if, if if someone wanted to establish trees in a pasture, that would be something that that we could consider. Um, obviously, everything is site specific to that person's land and the client, and it's based on their conservation plan. So one thing we'll work on a conservation plan, identify practices. Equip is there to address resource concerns, so um, there would have to be an identified resource concern <clears throat> in order to be eligible for the program. Okay. Um, but uh, so that would be mainly, so that would be potentially establishing silver pasture. It would be, you know, if they had a forest system that they wanted to maybe start grazing within, um, you know, if they wanted to establish wind, windrows or wildlife habitat along field borders. Um, we also have a riparian buffer initiative that's through EQIP that's specifically just for establishing riparian buffers. We have a riparian buffer practice, um, you know, so if someone was interested in a riparian buffer, then we'd be looking at it as, you know, what, what would be the purpose of, of that riparian buffer, but we can also look at different ways of, you know, combining those practices together, you know, to meet, you know, multiple, say, objectives that a landowner might have. Gotcha. Cool. But yeah, and we also have like a, just a tree establishment and shrub establishment practice as well, you know, so mm -hmm. if, if really it came down to they wanted to establish trees and that was going to address a resource concern on their property, then, you know, we could just look at, uh, you know, a simple tree and shrub planting as well. Cool. No, then, the conservation stewardship program has enhancements, so it's really building off of 
say like if someone did do alley cropping or they had a hedgerow and and then there were an enhancement that was going to kind of build off of that practice that was already established. Right. Mark, you had something. Yeah, whenever I want to talk, I can't unmute myself for some reason. Um, Noah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I know you can't share like the names or uh, our landowners with us, but I'm, one question is, uh, have, are you starting to see more landowners looking at uh, adoption? Um, and two, uh, could you make out, or I was wondering if you could share the information of this group to landowners. What do you, um, let's see. I- The resource, yeah. Yeah, as a resource, the, yeah. Uh, the, uh, as far as whether or not we're seeing more adoption of this practice, um, I can't say. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Not that I can't say it, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of it. What we're seeing a lot of is like wildlife habitat plantings, which can involve um, trees and shrubs. Um, but we're not seeing like specifically silva pasture focused projects or alley cropping focused projects. And I think that's just because um, we really haven't been promoting it or it hasn't really been promoted and cust you know, clients, it's not really all what clients are, you know, coming to our office for assistance for, but mm -hmm. I imagine we'll probably see more of it as, you know, more information and outreach um, comes out and, you know, with their regenerative agriculture, I think people are kind of kind of starting to look at how they might integrate trees and shrubs into their kind of conventional ag, ag operations. And then as far as um, what I just provided here, yeah, you, you can share that with the, with the public if you'd like. <clears throat> and um, I would encourage anyone, you know, who's interested, you know, to contact their local NRCS representative at the field level, you know, for a customer within that county who wanted to get more information. I do want to say too that Patrick and Mark and I are part of a collaboration on through, uh, with some grant funding to increase um, education about agroforestry in our region. And so we're going to be putting on, we're going to be developing some videos and creating some webinars, creating a guide, um, and doing eventually a sort of a conference or workshop around, or, you know, like multiple, multiple day workshop around agroforestry in Washington state. So I heard you say that you're involved in education with NRCS and staff. So it, it may be great to collaborate on, on some of that education and how it gets out to all different types of agency staff in our region, all those different folks that are working with landowners and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. We'll yeah, because the focus of that yeah. is professionals as well. The focus of, yeah, the focus of it is professional education um, for agency folks. So DNR folks, NRCS folks, all, yeah, uh, S, uh, CD <laughs> folks, um, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, sign me up. <laughs> right on. Definitely, you know, loop me in and, and uh, yeah, we'll see what we can do from my end. Also, uh, I guess this is a question for both uh, Marty and Noah. You know, one of the things that I think uh, would really help uh, in just establishment is getting examples. Um, and, you know, one example that's just really appealing to the public or, or professionals is pictures, you know, um, or establishment plans, uh, costs associated with that. And again, I don't know what NRCF can and cannot share, but, you know, if, if you guys could like share with, you know, some really good quality like sites or, you know, poor quality sites too, um, but I feel like we've got enough of those. Um, that would be really helpful too. Uh, I would love to see that partnership. If there's anything I can do to help facilitate that, please let me know. Yeah, well, I think but, Marty. Oh, sorry. I, I think Marty. Say, go ahead, Noah. <laughs> I was going to say we can't share any information unless the actual client allows us to release it. You know, so um, we could we could definitely talk to a landowner about you know if they'd be willing to 
you know, share their experience or any, any aspects of their project, even, you know, have people out to see what they're doing. Um, it, it would just be up to the landowner. <clears throat> Marty kind of made that point where she says in the chat that she wants, you know, uh, local examples of, of how these systems look and how they're integrated. Um, and that's, that's definitely something that we're doing a lot in Western Washington, um, getting some of these examples on the ground or finding where they exist and trying to document um, some of costs, management, um, you know, what it looks like to establish all of those kinds of things. So that's that's definitely something that we're actively working on. And yeah, if NRCS has folks that we can uh, document some of what they're doing to grow that local example, that body of local examples out, um, that's that would be fabulous. Um, I'm waiting for one of you guys to tell me how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know how to avoid root damage, how wide to put them, what percent cover so that you get forages with the right levels of sugars. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a piece today. There's people are using fences to keep the animals out of the trees. Okay, there's one piece. We we make rows, you know. Yep. And how do you do that to uh, you know, a long-term rotation system? We've got to get Mark. Uh, Mark's been head down in Silva Pasture um, for a few years here now. We got to get him to talk with you, Marty, um, but also to present to the group as well on what he's learned and found out. Um, Mark's got a lot of knowledge here that um, we need to get out of his brain, um, but we're, we're all still learning as well through, through local examples and farmers who are doing this. Yeah, we've talked about the kind of chicken egg of it all and, yeah, you know, just trying to encourage landowners to do it, but they want to see examples to do it, that kind of thing. But when we get these examples on the ground, it's really important that we partner so that we can document that and, and take lots of pictures, make fact sheets, make videos, whatever we can so that people can get an idea of what that is. Um, I think that's the best way to really generate interest. Kevin says, come to my place in about 10 years and take as many pictures as you want. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> we, are exactly right. of, we are seeing a lot of newly established systems um, right. that are yeah. younger, right? Like between one and five years somewhere. Um, so I think some of that's going to be getting a few more years on some of these systems. Um, but yeah, one, we are going to be capturing some of this in both Washington and Oregon through some videos that we're going to be creating around different agroforestry practices. So we've got some landowners identified who are doing this in our region, and we're gonna get down to getting some good documentation and resources actually created. Um, some tangible stuff that you all can get your hands on. I think um, we also need examples of how not to do it. I find a yeah. lot of landowners think, oh, well, I have a couple of acres of woods and I can just run my animals in there. And that's, you know, agroforestry, silvopasture, and it's actually just a really big mess. Yeah. It's so, a really good know, it's, we need to, to make sure that people know that it's a very intentional system, not just open the gate. Yes. And I think we Agreed. have some good examples of how not to do it. <laughs> I'm sure Mark's seen some of those. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 a good point. You know, showing how to do it, but also showing how not to, maybe. <laughs> yeah. This has been great conversation, everyone. Um, we are at time, so um, I don't mind sticking around for a few more minutes here. But um, if people have to go, um, we are at our time. And thank you. And I just want to mention that we won't be meeting in August, just out of recognition right. of the field season and everybody being busy, hope maybe having fun in the summer. I don't know. It's possible. Um, but we so will how be do back I in... get how do I get on the mailing list? Um 
I can check you. I thought you might be, Marty, but um, if you're not, I will make sure you are. Thanks. Yeah, Noah was kind enough to forward this on to me today. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, then in that case, um, I'll make sure you're added. Yeah. And yeah, we're, we what, are, what is our next um, presentation, Patrick, just to let folks know really quick? It is in October, just pulling it up real quick. October 11th, we have Dr. Stephanie Chismar from Forest Service again. Yeah, and she's going to be talking about agroforestry and land use policy. So this is something we've talked about before. Um, you know, it's a big question, but also carbon opportunities. So that should be a really good conversation. Great. Thank you all. Um, have a great summer. And yeah, if you're on our mailing list, we may be sending out some updates over the summer. And then for sure, we will be reconvening in October. Um, so yeah, great. Thank you. Everybody. Bye, everybody. See you later.